Hour 3 on Friday is, of course, the Preparedness, Earth Changes, and Civil Defense Hour. We have our expert, John Moore, preparedness expert and consultant. Of course, his website is thelibertyman.com, his radio show at Central Standard Time, 7 to 9 a.m. on Republic Radio. And Ann Morrison, our scientist, expert on volcanology, earthquakes, earth changes, ultraviolet light. And i got some recent links now that are quite concerning uh, regarding this. Our expert on volcanology and uh, solar radiation, Ann Morrison. And uh, her website, of course, is homeland-defense-4u.com. And she has over on her site as well emergency kits and other materials there that are quite remarkable that she has available for your sale. John has lots of remarkable equipment. Uh, that you can do as a prepper, including the uh, Special Forces bicycle, etc. And at the bottom of the hour we're having today, we couldn't have him yesterday, Chris Harris will be back, our nuclear expert and consultant, with the latest updates on the danger of a zirconite cladding uh, pyrophoric fire due to a fall of the Building 4 cooling pool, which is up on stilts at 100 feet, and many other things going on. Welcome back to the program, John Moore, host of the Liberty Man Show over on Republic Radio. Good afternoon, sir. Well, Dr. Bill, I got confirmation earlier today that uh, at Fort Carson, Colorado, there are now 600 Russian Special Forces troops, they call themselves Sputznats, uh, on the ground in, at Fort Carson as we speak. In addition, in metro Denver area, there have been sightings of Russian military helicopters in the air. A Russian hind helicopter, which of course is their their heavy uh, uh, helicopter they use for various military operations, including assault uh, and and, heli- and rocket missions, and another uh, as yet unidentified, uh, fairly new apparently Russian military aircraft, uh, wearing the bright red star that the Russian helicopters wear. Wear um, so. Myself and my my research team, my associates, uh, we, we are very very concerned about this. Uh, well, the very fact that they, even, even if it's only six hundred men, the fact is this is as, as large as you get for special forces. The second well, is the, why are we American, training? Right. You know, why are we right. training American, foreigners on our weapons and tactics? I mean, this is craziness. It is. Uh, a full size American special forces group is six hundred men. Uh, so, when it, if it was infantry or armor, it would not uh, look, look like a lot. But for special forces troops, it is a lot. Uh, these men are highly trained, highly skilled, have uh, a lot of capabilities, and of course, being Russian spetsnaz, they speak English with a neutral Nebraska accent. You could be standing in, in line behind one in, in Walmart wearing. He might be wearing a a polo shirt and jeans, and you would never know that. He was not a native-born American. Well, uh, let, let's so, put it this way. A 600-man team could take a city like Denver or Los Angeles and take control over it, over infrastructure, uh, actually, over they, they could They could be split up into dozens of 12-man teams, each right. 12-man team capable of bringing down a city. Right. And that, the people that, don't understand that. They're, they're trained and they have the equipment and the tactics. And uh, the Russians are right at the pinnacle of that training, along with our special forces and SEAL teams and our uh, you know, our, our, you know, SEAL Team Six, etc., uh, and our Special Forces teams, uh, right up there with the Israeli Special Forces. The Russians are no slouches; they're really top notch. Oh, they're t- they're tough, and they're well respected within the military communities. So we have a lot to be concerned about here. And, and the reports I'm getting about the numbers coming in between now and the rest of the year still stand uh, between thirty thousand and a hundred thousand. Russian special forces to arrive in the United States between now and the 1st of January. Right. I, I want you to, to repeat that because we had a report that was saying that that was all not true, that you're reporting it, and Mr. Hagman, who is actually one of your sources, and you've had other sources confirm this, that uh, Joel Skousen was saying, oh, no, that's not true. There are only 20 men going to Fort Carson. Well, uh, It's not well, 20, it's 600 at minimum, plus many more thousands are coming, and I know because I actually worked with Delta and special forces, there are at any one time since the mid-90s and before anywhere between several hundred thousand and up to 1.2 million troops from foreign countries training on American forces at military bases like uh, Fort Riley in Kansas, etc., being trained on weapons and tactics inside the continental United States. That, right. to well, me, is a crazy Joel policy. Joel Skousen is certainly, Joel Skousen can certainly have his opinion. I trust my sources. My sources are private sources that, that I've, I've known and trusted for years. Right. And uh, uh, the Hagman, uh, and Mr. Hagman, Doug Hagman, has a reputation for being a good investigator and a good investigative journalist, as I well, do. There's and three reasons I why I would think... 
There's three reasons why I think that you're right uh, in terms of logistics. And the first one is I think that we're likely to see a meltdown of the European economy by the summer. Uh, it looks like that uh, right now the refinancing for debt for Spain is up to 5.15%, which rose from 3.74%. It looks like Greece is already per- uh, perched at a uh, June 17th, you know, just a month away, election where the Aziri party will actually back completely out of the idea that they said they will stop paying their debt if the Europeans stop giving them money. And they're not going to do austerity fascism that kills people like the gentleman that committed suicide in front of the Greek parliament. The second thing that's likely right. to happen is we're going to have a pyrophoric fire or a major radiation release sometime in the next number of months, not years, from Fukushima. They're having a constant release. We're going to have a major, major release. And it could be burps over centuries, literally not just decades. So that means a lot of our food in the Northern Hemisphere is going to start to become increasingly radioactive and people are going to wake up. If there's a massive uh, emergency evacuation of Tokyo or greater Tokyo area, Northern Tokyo, This is going to wake people up to say, yes, we have a crisis, and people are going to start freaking out when it reaches the level of the sensor band in their brain to say, oh, my gosh, the regular media can't hold back the storm of truth that, in fact, they're ignoring the fact that the northern hemisphere is getting salted with cesium. Now, cesium makes your cells leak electrons. It literally makes the transmembrane potential drop, and it emerges pandemics. And I just looked at the latest reports. I have them up from Dr. Henry L. Nyman, who's one of the leading people on recombinomics, his website. And uh, almost certainly we're looking at genetic changes, which means the H5N1 p- pandemic are literally probably months away, not years now. Now, I gave a lecture back in 2006 about this. A lot of people say, oh, that's all hogwash. It's not going to be a pandemic. It's a matter of reducing herd immunity of the population because of illness and the gradual genetic changes that occur spontaneously now that they release these pre-weaponized versions which have been pushed beyond the normal firewalls of nature it's only a matter of time before we have a super plague of h1n1 h5n1 or some recombinant that's going to cause a super plague and that doesn't even include recombinant other pathogens from god knows what we've got flesh-eating bacteria we've got resistant tb we've got all kinds of resistant lyme disease now we've got Many, many plagues, and the people exposed in Japan are going to be a hot spot, literally a cauldron, for releasing super pathogens. And people don't know that. They don't realize that these populations exposed to these radiation is the technique that the military and the advanced weapons labs discovered was the way you make bioweapons. You take a population or a vector, like a person or an animal, expose them to a pathogen and irradiate the heck out of them, whether it's lethal or sublethal, and the pathogen becomes deadly. That's what's right. going to well, happen. People, people will be clamoring. People will be demanding these vaccines loaded up with mercury and all the other well, nasty the, the, stuff in there. Uh, yeah, now they're saying they're going to be months away from a universal vaccine against H1N1 flu. When it's untested, they know they're going to be laced with adjuvants that will be very neurotoxic and immunotoxic. And just like the whooping cock vaccine, the latest research published by the Journal of the American Medical Association and pediatric journals have stated that those who get the whooping cough vaccine have a greater chance of getting whooping cough. This is an exactly. example of the exactly. of the insanity of them trying to legislate here in California and elsewhere, forcing parents to give vaccines or trying to browbeat children to take the HPV vaccine. These people in the legislature and these doctors that are gutless, scientific morons that try to push this, what they need is better hygiene. If someone's sick and going to school, they should go home. Absolutely. <laughs> Well, Dr. Bill, I, I, I do have some other equipment this afternoon, and I want to give Ann some time to talk about Yeah, I want you to talk about that. So I, pre- I think that's very important, John, and I think that we've got that and we've got the meltdown. I think those are enough issues, but I think there's some galactic and other issues that are going on. We have another CME heading that could hit today or tomorrow, and it's almost certainly this AR-1476 uh, sunspot is going to cause us a lot of trouble in the next few months. It's literally many times the diameter of Earth. Um, so... We certainly I can have a lot hear- plate and, and a lot to get educated on, don't we? Absolutely, we do. Uh, thank you, John, for your update report. Again, visit thelibertyman.com. And, of course, this show is 7 to 9 a.m. Central Standard Time, Monday to Friday on Republic Radio, the Liberty Man. Ann Morrison, homeland-defenseforyou.com. We'll hear Ann's report on the space weather, the earthquakes, volcanoes, and UV. Now our expert on so many areas in science, Ann Morrison, and I'm putting up a link here, uvawareness.com, and it's amazing. You can key in uh, your uh, your actual, you know, 
postal zip code, and it'll tell you, like Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, what the UV index is. And here in Vista, California, between 12 and 1, it's up to like uh, 9.6. And coming up Monday, it's going to be 11.2, 11.3, which that's dangerous. In other words, between 11 and 3, do not, and I'm saying do not go out in the sun to suntan unless you have broad-brimmed hats, UV protection type clothing. A lot of clothing, the UV light will go through. And don't don't think even if it's a cloudy day, you're protected, or if it's not even hot, because 90% of the higher energy ultraviolet light gets right through the clouds like it's not there, even if it's not warming you. In the really nasty light, the UVC and UVD, which we don't even have proper meters to measure, most of the meters you'll buy out there are UVA and B. A is for tanning, B is for burns, C is for cancer, and D is for death, which means it literally suppresses your immune cells and can kill you. And people don't know that those lights are increasing because the ozone layer worldwide is decreasing, and it's dramatically thinning since three factors. Number one, the decrease in magnetic field. Number two, the chewing up of the ozone layer by other than xenon 133 and radioiodine from Fukushima. And number three, the decrease in oxygen that's been coming on over the last century because of the so-called energy age and the use of abiotic fuel, because there's no such thing as dinosaurs and ancient ferns causing the formation of fuel. Everybody knows this dirty secret that the bowels of the earth is where oil comes from, and most of these tar balls lining up on the coast of uh, Louisiana and Alabama, Texas, are radioactive because they come from a nuclear reaction creating larger molecules deep in the bowels of the earth, many miles below the crust. That's what's going on, 40,000 feet down. Well, that's, that's right, and I want people to know, in fact, those people that uh, on Monday are going to have an 11.3 UV index, um, they need to really take this seriously. 11.3, yeah. if you're outside in it any well, length at, of time, can seriously damage your immune system, yeah, and it can it, give it, you a serious burn, and it can well, make you blind. Uh, well, yeah, it, it, look at this, UV index. Uh, here it is. I'm just going to give you some ideas and around the world. It says, Mexico City, right now, around the world, Mexico City uh, at one o'clock is going to hit thirteen point nine, and, and and at two o'clock thirteen point nine in Mexico 14, City. Fourteen point two today. Uh, right now in uh, Mumbai, uh, India, it, it is uh, extreme at twelve point zero. Uh, in Shiraz, uh, it's going to be eleven point six, which is the Middle East, and at Kuala Lumpur. It's 11.4, and at 1 o'clock, it's 12.9. So the highest today is 14.2 at 2 p.m. today. 2 p.m., right? Uh, Mm -hmm. 2 p.m. today, 14.2. Like, oh, my God. I mean, really, that's how crazy this is. And people, they don't realize that, and I as I say, one of the visions that I had many years ago, uh, that I saw was the crops literally turning white. And what happens is, um, our, I trained under a botanist uh, 40 years ago who was a head botanist for not only Dalhousie, but also he was at Harvard. He was also at University of British Columbia. He was one of the top botanists in the world and needed research on carbon dioxide for increasing the growth of plants. So all of the work on carbon dioxide for increasing greenhouses. He also did work on ultraviolet light, and he predicted that a major what's called UV shock of 60, 45 to 50 minutes, 60 minutes, of 45 to 75 percent would kill all of our grain forming crops and one third of the trees that are in bloom. And that's right out of the Bible. People need to know that these scientists are finding things that are confirmed by biblical prophecy. So I'm saying all you need is a major decrease, like a release of things that are going to cause a major disappearance of the ozone layer like xenon-133 and radioiodine, a major fluctuation, a decrease in the magnetic field, which can occur literally momentarily, and a major CME, a coronal mass ejection, bringing in uh, uh, these high-energy particles, and you could have your crops just zapped. Bam! All of a sudden you say, funny, the, you know, the wheat's not growing anymore, and it's all the fields have turned white. Well, it says right in the Bible, when you see the fields turn white, it is time for the harvest. Not just a harvest of the crop, but a harvest of mankind, because we're literally going to be facing food that'll have to have citizen committees going out there with a little radiation detector like the ones that we recommend now, the Inspector EXP with a little radiation arm and stickers saying with a not sign, not radioactive. So they go to the produce and this and that counter, and I'm calling for citizens now because the government won't do their job. You can take your EXP and walk it right over to the produce counter and put a sticker on and say not radioactive because if you don't see a sticker in the near future, if there's a major release from Fukushima, you can assume It's radioactive. Uh, Dr. Bill, also I want you to know that when they calculate the sun index, 
they use the uh, amount of moisture in the air, the uh, amount of dirt in the air, the air quality, and then the location of the sun, you know, it follows an ecliptic path. It doesn't yeah. just go over the equator, but they do not factor in the thinning of the ozone, of the stratosphere. Right. Now, one of the things that's going to happen this weekend on the 20th is a, a solar, uh, a lunar solar eclipse. That's a big deal. It's the first time in many, many years, and that's going to pass right over. It's incredibly dangerous for people to go outside and look at the sun. They will burn their eyes out of their head, and they also are at high risk of getting permanent retinal damage. Tell us about that, because people are not aware. We put the space weather information up on this. Even my daughter with Down syndrome is being taught in her special ed class about the solar uh, lunar eclipse. This is dangerous. People don't understand. This is how people in the ancient times looked up to the sun when those high priests would look away, and they could look down the ground and see the, the disk of the sun and the corona around it. It'll burn the eyes right out of your head, and you don't understand that your eyes don't have protective reflexes. You cannot look at the sun and not get damaged. Yes, people might um, might think that they, they can just look at it because you're just going to see a rim. You're going to see a, a ring of the sun. Uh, it's not, uh, not going to cover the whole sun. There's going to be a, what they call a, a, a ring of the sun. And you think that, oh, well, it's just part of the sun, and so it won't hurt my eyes. It will hurt your eyes. You either have to look at your LDD uh, finder on your camera or... You can uh, use a mirror to cast a shadow or a picture of the eclipse on, onto a wall or onto the outside part of your house, and you'll be able to see it. But yeah, you, you want to look at it indirectly, in other words. You want to look at it indirectly, like looking at the ground or a piece of cardboard. Or if you have a solar telescope, you can look at the solar telescope eyepiece where it will protect you. But you need, if you're going to look directly at it, you have to have those really powerful, I think it's called number 17 welder's glass. Otherwise, don't. You will permanently damage your eyes. That's right. Uh, and you can use a pinhole camera. I, I built one of those one time. I mean, it's just, you just yeah, I've seen punch those. a pinhole I, in a box, and then I, you can see the sun on the or what's yeah. left of the sun on the other side. Yeah, I saw it back in Nova Scotia many years ago when we had a pinhole cameras, and we used those for ways. But you do not want to look directly at the sun. It's very dangerous. Uh, so what else is happening? Earthquakes, volcanoes around the world. What else is going on, Anne? Well, I wanted to put out a warning to the uh, residents near Mount Vesuvius. There was a uh, person, a, a tourist, who um, who uh, was taken by coach to the uh, top of Mount Vesuvius, and he he got to the crater and he collapsed, and in fact he died. Now I'm attributing that to VOG, which is volcanic organic gases. By the way, that's happening out of uh, out of the volcanoes in Hawaii too. The VOG is actually the level of sulfur dioxide and nitric oxide and other dangerous pollutants is much higher than any city on Earth. Downwind of the volcanoes on the Big Island of Hawaii, most people don't realize that. Well, yeah, and uh, I think that needs to be people need to know about that so that they can take action. Yeah, when we come back, we'll hear more, too, about volcanoes and earthquakes around the Earth, because I expect to see superquakes, especially if this uh, AR-1476 CME, which is going to strike the Earth today and tomorrow, may trigger off some superquakes. They're giant. Welcome back, and uh, and tell us more. We're also uh, going to be joined by Chris Harris, our nuclear expert. So uh, let's lay the groundwork. What's happening in earthquakes and volcanoes? You mentioned about Mount Etna and the dangers there. Any other volcanoes or earthquakes elsewhere? And, of course, the danger of VOG. Of course, in Hawaii, people aren't aware that the pollution is that great on the Big Island. Well, I was talking about Mount Vesuvius. Yeah, it Mount Vesuvius, like I mean, yeah. Yeah, that's up in central Italy. And, uh, you know, that's where they had that 6.4 earthquake uh, back in 2009, April right. 2009. And at that time, the seismologist uh, said there was it was a radon alert. He said, I've got too much radon coming up here. There's going to be an earthquake. And sure enough, there was. And there was one big enough to kill 200 people in central wow. Italy, which is fairly civilized. I mean, that's a fairly civilized part of the world. You know, it's not mud huts or anything like that. You know, uh, couple that with this fellow that, uh, this tourist that went to the top of Mount Vesuvius, he was driven up there in a coach, he walked to the edge of the crater and he collapsed. 
I think that there are volcanic organic gases that are being admitted, <laughs> emitted by Mount Vesuvius. And I do want to put a warning out to the people uh, that are living on its slopes that they need to be aware that Mount Vesuvius may, may be becoming active. And that was the one that uh, killed the people in Pompeii. And uh, we think that what happened was that it was the organic gases, the hydrogen sulfide and the and, um, carbon dioxide that was emitted by the mountain and uh, killed them, and then they were covered and buried in ash. Yeah, exactly. In fact, I think that's exactly what happened in previous times. And the same thing can happen, by the way, in Hawaii. Most people aren't aware that these toxic gas clouds will kill you very quickly. They do something very interesting, and there's research going on in, on suspended uh, animation. They discovered that low concentrations of hydro um, uh, of hydrogen sulfide gas will actually stop mitochondrial function, low concentrations, and actually suspend animation. So one of the things about deep space travel, they're thinking about put people into suspended animation by giving them a low concentration of hydrogen sulfide, gradually increasing it while monitoring life signs, and then lowering body temperature to the point where they literally, you know, lower your heart rate down to, you know, very, very slow, and put you into suspended animation for deep space travel. And uh, if you get it too heavy a whiff, it just kills you. It literally kills you and preserves you, and then when you get buried in ash, it, you have a very well-preserved body because it doesn't normally rot, because the hydrogen sulfide kills all the pathogens off, so you don't normally rot. Well, and that's what they found when they went into Pompeii. They discovered these well-preserved bodies. Yeah, they weren't. They didn't rot. I mean, it's amazing. You say, well, you'd expect all the bowel bacteria and everything to eat them alive. No, no self-respecting pathogen can survive hydrogen sulfide. It'll kill them all, too. Yeah. And uh, let's see, the other examples I have is where the Russian airplane fell, uh, flew into the site of Mount Salak. And uh, so you've, they said long dormant. Well, I looked it up on the website, uh, John Seach's website, and it... It apparently the volcanic organic gases killed a group of um, seven children that were camping on its side uh, in 2007. So you know they don't even consider these uh, VOG as an indication of an active seismic zone for volcanoes. You know we need to have some warning when people are dying on these mountains. It could have been that the pilot was overcome by uh, hydrogen well, sulfide. I, I- I think what we do need to do, just like we have in a tsunami warning center, we need to have a what's called a VOG warning uh, center with satellite and other types of uh, communications networks, including repeaters that can be set up with ham radio operators, because if there's a major disruption of the <coughs> ionosphere, of the, ionosphere the best ground-based communications is what's called repeaters that can repeat a signal every 50 to 75 miles by ham radio operators, and even digital uh, burps of information can be sent over this network very quickly all over the world. So we need to integrate the volcanic, uh, earthquake, and tsunami warnings and other warnings because some of the things will knock out right away the satellite-based communications, including the early warning systems, that a major thing's going to happen. Uh, the Harrington event uh, is a good example. We easily could have our normal warning systems to tell us about a coronal mass ejection coming in and a major pulse of, of highly charged uh, uh, electrons first, then the follow-up of uh, protons and then plasma hitting the Earth and literally frying everything electronic on the planet, especially that's plugged in and that's not been shielded by a Faraday cage. Uh, the Harrington event, if it happened today, it happened in 1859, would fry the modern civilization and make it a pre-Tesla, pre-20th century civilization back to horse and buggy. It would be pretty devastating. Well, I think that's right. Uh, and in fact, um, they, in the emergency reports, that I, emergency management reports that I've read out of the federal government, they say that their systems, uh, their emergency management is based on public power being available. They have no redundancy in case public power is not available. And it, like you said, an EMP or a CME could take out public power. And then they know it, but they just, you know, there's no backup for for not having public power available in case of an emergency. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, I think we have our nuclear expert now, Chris Harris, there. Uh, let's talk about what's going on with the uh, nuclear situation, Chris. Hi, Chris. Okay. 
Yeah, How are you, you doing, Ann? Yeah, we, we have some, uh, I call the oh my geez, you know, the oh my god uh, situation in terms of the danger of a pyrophoric fire or the constant release of uh, millions of becquerels of radiation per hour from Fukushima, the danger of the, of the semi-liquefied uh, radioactive isotopes underneath it, the corium. They've never built a corium catcher, never put spider silk corium, uh, you know, tents over, never used filtration systems to properly concentrate this or turn it into a solid so they can transport it safely to the bottom of tin mines or deep mines in the earth. Nothing's been done. They've, they're talking now about a committee. And, of course, no one's using ground-penetrating radar or gamma emission uh, visualizing systems to determine where the hell the corium is. I'm asking questions here of these scientists, and we have statements by people like Mishu Kaku that says he thinks it's, quote, 100% liquefied. How does he know unless he's got a really good nuclear crystal ball? I would like to know, number one, with the ground-penetrating radar and gamma cameras, where is the corium? Is it 60 meters down? Where is it? And is it near a water table? If it is, we're going to have hydrovolcanic explosions because of the formation of deuterium and what's called slow neutrons, which means it's going to make that critical material turn supercritical, causing a nuclear explosion. And a hydrogen explosion can trigger, just like the uh, Krytron switches, fast switches, and uh, the plastique around a nuclear bomb, this could trigger a really big nuclear explosion underground. Well, you know, being solution-oriented, and we did bring this up before, uh, we would have to understand exactly the extent of the damage of the corium, where it is, the state of it, and so that we could, or somebody could come up with a, a viable cleanup strategy. Right. If, so, if it's so liquid, it's you can even suck it out, or you can create some kind of a... 100%, you know, liquid, that, that, that doesn't really do us much good. We need to get in there, just like you said, and, and, and ascertain the yeah. absolute state of it now. And if it's, uh, by the way, if it's fragment, maybe what we need to do is build side tunnels to go down. Maybe we need to put some kind of boronated nanoparticle material and form some kind of material to prevent it from going supercritical down there. Maybe we need to have a way of venting off any hydrogen that's coming off, just like the, uh, the wet well cor- uh, hydrogen uh, venting system that they should have had operational, but they build a faux system around these Mark I reactors. And if we had that, we could have a way of bleeding off the hydrogen and, and radioactive tritium so we wouldn't have a hydrogen based explosion underground. So we literally now have to figure out where the heck all the stuff is and then piecemeal pick up where these corium things are 60 meters, 100 meters down below ground and build ways of containing and preventing a hydrogen explosion, hydrovolcanic explosion, and or a nuclear explosion underground. We need to be watchful forever. Yeah, now we were discussing Unit 4 and the precarious condition of that plant and, and why it is so precarious, and that is there was some major structural damage. Uh, yeah. to Unit 4, and we don't really know what's going on in the spent fuel pool. Now, why is the spent fuel pool so important there is because all of the fuel at Unit 4 is in the spent fuel pool, with presumably the um, the reactor head off, so it's all full of water. So if you get a hole anywhere in, in that particular system, including the reactor, uh, you would drain, you'd start draining the spent fuel pool since, since it's all connected. It's one big system right now. So... That, that's a, a special vulnerability that we don't talk about much. You know, we talk about Unit 1, Unit 2, and Unit 3, yeah. and anyway. Orium. But this is, a, this is even a, I've always been a big bug on... Keep on, that on thought. Unit. We'll be right back. Chris Harris, our nuclear expert. Welcome back, and uh, tell us more, Chris. What are the dangers? I see uh, two major events happening probably in the, between now and the end of 2012. I see the meltdown of the economy in Europe, which will drag down our five major banks. We see the uh, J.P. Morgan losing not $2 billion, but it's now estimated $5 billion, which is actually uh, part of the whole scam raising between $700 trillion and $1.6 quadrillion of debt that's been created out of thin air that's really resold debt over and over again. On, on top of that, we have the craziness of the Israelis saying they're ready to go, as they, Darth Vader says on some of the little video ops that they have on now on your, you can get your iPad, you know, ready to go. In other words, the Israelis and the American military under Obama, who says he's a man of peace, who got the peace prize, they need to spell it, P-I-E-C-E, pieces of nations, pieces of the planet left after he's finished. 
And then the third thing is Fukushima. I see our food is sequentially getting more and more radioactive. Radioactive needles now discovered along the west coast of British Columbia, Oregon, and, and there. They're going to test clams now. They found radioactive, uh, the radioactive seaweed off the coast of California. We're now seeing whales and dolphins heading south and dying by the tens of thousands with sores and wounds and eyes out of, you know, all kinds of malformations on the uh, shores of Peru. We know that these things are happening. And people want to say, oh, it's not happening. It's just an event. It's not an apocalypse. Uh, I'm sorry to tell you uh, that the apocalypse has already started. And it's going to happen in burps and waves. But what's going on is when the ozone layer is thinning like this, when we're seeing Fukushima happen like this, when we have Macondo two years ago, and people aren't still waking up and they want to accuse us as being conspiracy theorists, they need an intellectual with a kiss on their nice cheek. They need a slap in the face to say, for God's sake, wake up, because your stupidity is lethal to me and everyone else if you continue to try to drive holes in the bottom of the boat when we're all trying to bail. This is not rational. And trying to be in a state of denial when we have a crisis going on, and it'll be the same people that arrive at our doorstep saying, well, we should have been preppers, we should have had food and water, we should have been prepared to see all the crops die from radiation, we should have been prepared to know to tell our daughter not to go out during the solar uh, eclipse or go up when the sun was hitting a, a, a you know 14 and a half well guess what you've now been notified stop thinking you have a right to an opinion about something that deals with facts so chris tell us how bad it's likely to get in the next number of months maybe a year or so with fukushima because we haven't seen the end we've just seen the start of something really catastrophic here haven't we okay let me let me just try to paint the picture about unit four and why we're talking about it no we recently it, a new survey came out, and it, it said that uh, it, that Unit 4 may not withstand a uh, seismic event of uh, 6 magnitude uh, earthquake if it's in the right location. And not surviving means that there will be collapse in at least, at least partial port, uh, uh, areas of it. So let me just talk about a little bit about the spent fuel pool. It's made of a 3 8 inch stainless steel plate. It's uh, basically a big, large box without a, uh, without a top, of course, like a big open pool, but it's supported. It also has 35 feet deep and about half as, uh, half again as wide as that. And then what happens is the spent fuel pool is in racks at the very bottom of the pool. And they're about, uh, each, each rack is about 13 feet long. Now, why do you need water in that spent fuel pool? Remember, we don't even know how much damage there is in that pool right now because it has not been able to get a survey in there. So how do you, how do, what is the water for? Well, the water, first, first of all, is for cooling. Now we need that so we can keep a zerk. Uh, alloy fire that we were discussing uh, from happening. That's 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 very important. But if you also have a lower, remember, there's like 30 feet of water above above the actual fuel. Uh, you need that for other reasons too. Shielding. You can't get near the spent fuel if you have lost your ability to shield the uh, really the very powerful uh, gamma rays that are coming out of the decay products in the fuel. So if you lose that. The heck with the cooling. You won't even be able to get close enough to do anything about it. Next thing, of course, there's neutron absorption, and that would prevent a uh, criticality or a recriticality in some of the assemblies. The fourth reason why you want water there is an iodine scrubbing effect. That is a uh, that's a design feature where if you do have a leaker, and I'm talking about not not much, but I'm not talking about devastating damage. But if you have a few leakers, as it's bubbling up through the water, you are scrubbing your iodine out of the water, so at least you, you can rely on some of that. Now, that's, those, are, those are four good purposes. Now, going back, if you lose any one of those, those functions, you, you've got major problems. So if we're talking about a devastating quake that's going to take out the bottom of the spent fuel pool, and there are drains, and there are also liner plate drains, so there are drains down there that could break. I mean, it, it doesn't have to take much uh, for that to happen. Uh, there has been a uh, there was a, a national lab report, and I sent you an excerpt from it, and it talks about the different strategies for coping with such an event. Now, what you can do, and you're talking about a plant that doesn't have damage and everything else, you could probably get in there and at least try to spray it down, which is not effective for a... Uh, and, and what happens is you have a spray, and you come on in there, and you try to cool the uh, fuel that way. But... That was shown to be ineffective for really fresh fuel. And the next thing you got is air cooling, which is totally ineffective for even fuel. The good news is that you have fuel that's uh, a year old out of the core. But if you have uh, 
but even still, there is uh, there's no guarantee that you're going to remove heat that way. And if you do get to 1700K, which is about what, uh, 2600 degrees Fahrenheit, you will liberate, you will ignite the fuel, the zircaloy surrounding each of the fuel assemblies, and you will liberate massive amounts more of, uh, well, well, first of all, of hydrogen, and we'll know what that would happen, and then all of a sudden you'll also expose the innards of the uh, the fuel, which is actually under pressure at this point because the fusion products build up over a period of time, and it'll just spurt out, and anything inside here where the real bad stuff is, that will cause a uh, release. And uh, and there's nothing to stop it. There's no housing around it, nothing else at all. So you're definitely going to get a a lot of, uh, well, you'll get a plume, basically, and it will go on for quite quite a while. Right. In other words, you're going to have not just an explosion. You'll have, it's almost like a pressure gun pushing out a massive surge of radiation that can go on for days, weeks, or hours. And uh, this can happen in repeated burps like this for centuries. So the problem is we have to start doing systematic analysis of where is the corium, where is the hydrogen being generated, where is the corium, is it large enough to, cr- to create heat spots so that you can actually see that the you're getting supercriticality going on. We need to have not only gamma cameras but neutron cameras that will actually pick up the presence of fast neutrons that are zipping out, for example, the ones that they saw initially at a reactor one which was broken before the tsunami hit. Those neutron beams were going 10 and 20 miles, 30 miles out into space and hitting at sundown the nitrogen in the air, and you could see these blue beams and look like, ooh, this is Star Wars. This is like Las Vegas. No, no, no. This is real bad. This is neutron beams coming out of hot reactors that went super critical. And tell us about why this is so dangerous. Well, in the case of uh, Unit 4, where, where there shouldn't be any more criticality and all, you can get a recriticality. Here's, here's how that happened. Right. To prevent such a criticality, you are depending upon the actual spacing of the fuel, the spent fuel in its racks. That's how that's how that's accomplished. If you damage that such that now all of a sudden you got uh, a reduced spacing between the fuel assemblies, well now you've just eliminated one of your guards against the criticality by by causing any spontaneous fission or any. Uh, there, there's still there's still neutron emitters. And there's still plenty of there's water in that area, so you'll moderate the neutron. You could actually get a criticality in the spent fuel pool. And we certainly don't want to see that because that, that would be a never ending process. That would be, there's no way to shut that down. And so, um, even the, you know, you know, like some of the, some of the fuel doesn't have, um, uh, uh, control blades. The boiling water reactor has control blades, not control rods. But right. So some of them are unbladed. So uh, those those would be the ones that you may get a, a, a fission. Of course, if you have a fission product, if you have, if you have a fission, then you're going to generate more fission products. And there, there you'd have a uh, uh, another never-ending fountain of, uh, of uh, you know particulates coming out and gas. At this point, so it would be uh, that would be a really major disaster. Yeah, in other words, and here's one of the former ambassadors. Number four reactor, a top national security issue. We don't have any our our state of for, minister of foreign affairs, our secretary of state Hillary Clinton. We don't have the so-called presidents, uh, Obama, sitting there preening around the uh, White House and now over at the G8 meeting talking about Fukushima. There's no talk. They're talking about Europe, like the meltdown of the economy is more important than the meltdown of Fukushima which could easily be fixed if they put Glass-Steagall in, would stop things like the uh, J.P. Morgan meltdown and that scam tastic idiocy of allowing them to create debt out of nothing and then sell it. Uh, closing comments, Ann. Uh, forewarned is forearmed, and you need to watch the UV index in your area and be prepared. You stay yeah, and get, inside. Get your radiation uh, kits. We have them available. Again, it has two NIOSH, N95 masks, two Neutrodyne, one Neutrotrella, one neutral Defense. Check this out. Get ready. Things are going to start rocking and rolling between now and the fall. Things are going to happen. <laughs> 